Okay, jumping into some case studies, um, just so I can show you a little bit about how my approach can be applied. Um, Angela, little Angela, she um, she's about three. She's a bit older now. She's more like four. She'd be about to turn four, I think, in August, if I'm not mistaken. Um, she has an un undiagnosed syndrome, so she has a cluster of different um, features and a, and a family history in that she has a, an older half-sister who has similar but not as severe um, features. Her global, her global developmental delay is severe, so she's severely affected across all the areas of her development. Um, her gross motor movement is kind of ataxic type. She doesn't have very good control over her range um, and of <coughs> movement. She, at this time, I think was just beginning to pull to stand. Um, she's not yet independently walking, but she's cruising, you know, around things. Um, so she's getting there. She's looking like she will be a walker, but it's slow coming. Um, she was also fairly recently and somewhat controversially um, diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder, and that was based largely on her unusual interactional style, um, uh, her communication delays, um, and her um, fondness, so, shall we say, for for routine and sameness and that kind of thing, um, and some sensory features. She has seizures, which are reasonably well controlled with medication, and some reflux, which is similarly reasonably well controlled with medication, certainly much better than what it was um, when she was younger. Her visual acuity is poor, and she, and she did fairly recently get these really cute glasses like goggles that have made a huge difference actually to her ability to relate to people. She's a non-verbal communicator at this point in time and she has for a long time been on um, puree meals and has taken thickened fluids from a spoon. She eats in a high chair at the table, pulled up to the table at home. <coughs> So after spending some time, well, a lot of time actually, with Angela and her family, I eventually, and this did take some repeated visits, I did have to spend some time sitting in her space um, and allowing her to sort of approach me on her own terms, crawl all over me, smell me, um, all of that kind of stuff um, before we proceeded into a mealtime assessment and I was very much you know in the background of that kind of thing um, to try and be as unobtrusive as possible. After a couple of mealtime assessments I was able to kind of try and tease out what was working for Angela and her mum and what was not working for Angela and for her mum in that two-way interaction that is the feeding relationship. Um, on the plus sides for Angela, she does actually often really enjoy her food and she's very accepting of, of range of tastes. So she, she will equally enjoy a quite a savoury, you know, meat and veggies type puree as a, as a sweet. She does particularly like her sm fruit smoothies, but she will just as happily eat, you know, her, her veggies. That's fine. Um, when she, once she got into the zone, she could anticipate the spoon, so she would open when she knew the spoon was coming. That was fine. Um, she could strip the spoon fairly well, so a lip closure on the spoon was pretty good. Um, I did notice that although the tendency is just to feed it straight into the middle and pull it out, that if you did sort of go over to the side, I could see that her tongue, you know, so she had some um, functional tongue movement developing. And a big strong thing for her was her, um, her good response to sameness and routine. So she was, you know, when she knew it was mealtime, she'd bum shuffle her way over to the table next to the high chair. She would, you know, she was quite happy to follow what was the, the expected behaviour or the expected part of the routine. On the not so strong side for Angela, I could see that orientation to the meal 
was really hard. Although she would get herself over to the high chair, once she was then lifted up, her arms would go and her legs would go and she'd be like this and she'd be screaming and squealing and getting that first mouthful in was had turned into like a force feeding situation pretty much that you know you'd have to hold her hands down and get that spoon <coughs> in after that she was all right after that initial thing she would you know be quite happy to take one but that first couple of minutes was a real struggle every meal time um, her arms were all over the place she was sitting in this little kind of egg-shaped high chair with it on a stand um, legs feet hanging out the sides arms all over the place she was although wanting to be involved in the routine clearly very stressed and anxious and the squealing and the hands over the face for that first mouthful was really um, uh, hard to watch, particularly when I understood that that was happening every single meal time. That was quite difficult. Um, an interesting feature for Angela is how much she struggles with new objects in her space. And you know, I've come across this in kids before. You know, they're very wary of different things. But um, for this little girl, and the OT had warned me um, of this with her. But you know, I had a stethoscope in my bag of tricks when I went to see her and I just bent down and pulled it out of the bag and I was standing back from the table um, but she caught that out of the corner of her eye and she was almost climbing out of the high chair. She was just that startled by that new thing in her space. Um, her responses to new objects is really quite extreme when taken by surprise. Um, she wasn't tolerating changes in texture, so it was the smooth puree, the smooth puree. <coughs> she wasn't tolerating utensil changes, so she liked, you know, her particular size of small spoon. That's what she liked. Um, and she wasn't using a cup. Um, the thickening of the fluids was really just about being able to spoon that in. It wasn't about what was going on here, although I did check that out. It was really just about um, it's easier to spoon a fluid in if it's not thin. Um, and that was really about her not wanting the cup in her face. So that was an issue. Mum was really, really persistent. You know, she was not going to quit. And when it came to when Angela had her mouth open and was wanting more, she was straight onto it with the, with the next mouthful. She was really had really strong skills in that area. And the food that she was offering was fantastic, all kind of homemade, lots of flavour. She was trying really hard to meet those nutritional needs by, you know, packing stuff in as much as she could. And the mealtime routine was really strong, so they had a real structure. They ate in the same place at the same time. She knew exactly what to expect and that was working really well. Mum was really anxious about how much she was eating. That whole thing of her not wanting the spoon in initially really raised the tension um, and that was really hard. So she was always trying to just get her to eat more and eat more and eat more um, and a lot of the time she was quite happy with that but she, mum was really focused on that volume and that was a problem. Um, she found it hard to interpret Angela's other messages so that while she was good with the I would like some more please mum message all of the other messages um, mum didn't seem to pick up on quite so well. They were very heavily dependent on using a little portable DVD player for meal times to try and get through that hump um, and that was kind of um, impeding I think the ability to work on that feeding relationship and um, get Angela engaged in the meal time. So, The first thing to think about was trying to decrease mum's stress and anxiety around the intake. So we talked to the dietitian, you know, is this a problem? Do we need to be worried about this? And as it turned out, things were actually pretty good for her intake and nutrition wise. She wasn't, she was a good weight for her size, for her height, for her age. Um, mum was really bulking up things nutritionally, all good on the nutrition front. Um, there were some concerns that maybe on days when her refusal was really unable to get 
uh, when her refusal was not able to be um, overcome, that supplementing things might be needed, but for the most part, she was all good. Um, so it was a relief, I think, for mum not to have to worry about that. That really calmed her down, which was good. I really wanted to work on that initial problem of Angela and her anxiety and her inability to just be calm at the start of a meal. Um, uh, that was a really crucial thing to improve. Um, and I wanted to increase her tolerance for any kind of change during the meal time, any kind of change. Uh, and that, of course, was with a view towards working on new textures and eventually working on the, on the holy grail of the cup drinking. Um, she did have some problems, I should, probably should have mentioned earlier, with um, saliva, so saliva control, saliva management, so she was a big dribbler. And her medical team had put her on, on glycopylorate so um, the fl her fluid intake was really important, um, making sure that she was getting enough fluids. And that was quite difficult with that whole thick and fluid spooning it in because it was just so drawn out and a lengthy process. So that was quite hard. <coughs> um, tiny changes, <coughs> starting from a strength, which is my strategy for getting this done. All right, so we've just had a fantastic talk from um, the OTs and physios about the importance and complexities of positioning. So I'm just going to throw in my two cents and say that um, I find that positioning, you know, is the, really the first thing I look at in paediatric feeding. And I do find that once, if you can work, look at the positioning and try and optimise the positioning, then a lot of other things fall into place. And then um, other things might be revealed then, um, but that's okay. Um, positioning and state, so the child's level of stress or anxiety or how they're feeling about the meal can be really closely related um, to their positioning. And if they're feeling stable in their body and stable in their space, um, a lot of that stress and anxiety really reduces quite dramatically. Um, they're quite symbiotic, these two things, state and positioning. They really affect each other. So if a child's really anxious and stressed and upset, then their positioning falls apart. And similarly, if their positioning is no good, then they become stressed and anxious and upset. So it's a very um, interconnected relationship between these two things. So yeah, as I've said, optimising state and positioning is, is usually the first thing and then th the rest will lead on from there. And that was definitely the case for Angela. So the first thing, one of the first things I did was get together with the OT and we raided our storage cupboard um, where we came across this ancient um, peg prego high chair, um, gave it a scrub, took it out to the family and by some stroke of complete luck, it was a perfect fit for Angela with a little bit of boosting under, under her bottom. Um, it was uh, quite high on the lateral support, quite high behind her back, um, was able, it had padding around the uh, lateral, so she was quite sort of stuck in there. And probably most crucially, um, the foot supports fit her absolutely perfectly. So the positioning couldn't have been better if I, you know, carved it out myself. It was absolutely perfect. And the change in her was almost instant, you know. I was really concerned given her difficulties with new things in her environment that she would freak out. Um, but she bum shuffled over to that chair and she was lifted into it and she didn't even really seem to realise that it wasn't different. And as soon as she settled into it, she just felt so good that it, she was fine. She was fine. And things just went from strength to strength with her from there. That was really the first crucial key to making change for this little girl. The next thing was about um, trying to implement changes based on her strengths around her actual oral intake now. Okay, so I knew that she was happy with different tastes because she'd be quite accepting of um, particular um, foods 
all the time. She was quite happy <coughs> to have different things. She wasn't fussy in that way. Um, but she wouldn't generally get different um, tastes within the meal. So mum would chuck it all in the blender and she would get that pot. And then she would get the drink, which would be different, but the actual meal would be all one taste. So to try and improve her tolerance for change, the first thing we did was starting from a strength was to encourage her to have two different tastes within the meal. So I used the around the bowl technique, um, which is something advocated by another one of my heroes, Marsha Dunn Klein, um, which allows you to control the amount of change dependent on the child's cues. So you have the two different kinds of things. So in Angela's case, it was two different kinds of flavor, but you could use it for two different kinds of texture or two different kinds of temperature or whatever it is that you're targeting at that time. Um, go for same, 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 little bit of difference straight back to same. So because you're in with the spoon and out with the spoon um, and then you do the change in with the spoon and out with the spoon and then straight back to the preferred, um, the child gets the is not confronted so much by the change because they know that you're coming back to the preferred and you can step that up or step that down quite easily because it's all right there. So you can, as you can see tolerance um, reducing, you can step back to the, to the preferred. Um, so we started that with two different tastes around the bowl technique. I did a gen very gentle introduction of new utensils in her environment. So that was basically not unlike that um, um, Toomey's, you know, steps, you know, do you tolerate it in your environment? Do you tolerate it on the table? Do you tolerate it on the plate? I, with food, I did a similar thing with Angela and utensils. So, you know, I'd get the things out of my bag while she wasn't looking and I'd put them on the far side of the table, um, different utensils, and then slowly, slowly move them closer until they were in her space and then I was touching them sitting next to her and um, move them closer and then use them to feed her and that kind of thing. Um, so using different shaped spoons, a fork, the other end of the spoon or the fork, uh, straws and those spiky nuck gum brushes. Um, Another thing I like to use is food as spoons, so apple slices, carrot sticks, not expecting that she would eat those, but just that having the experience of those foods um, to smell them and to feel them in her mouth is her first experience of those kinds of foods. Um, so we, we did all that kind of stuff with her. It was a very slow and gradual type um, approach, but that seemed to be what was necessary for her based on what her strengths were. <coughs> we were then able to start to introduce the cup in the same way. So she was tolerating the cup in her space in that the drink was in the cup, prepared in the cup, um, and then fed to her with the spoon from the cup. So really that was a matter of using the thickened fluids in the cup, um, bringing it closer to her in her space, and then bringing it closer to her and then feeding it from here with the thing and then touching it, you know, would she tolerate a tap? Would she tolerate it close up? Would she tolerate a sip? And this was a very slow and gradual process. Tiny, tiny, transient changes. So always then going back to the safety option every time and just building up very slowly and gradually from there. The other really crucial thing that I encouraged and always encourage 100% is joining in with family meals all the time. So not feeding the kids in isolation or, you know, sometimes that's necessary just from a logistics point of view, but if that is necessary, still get them up to the table for the family meals. Um, she's a funny little thing, but she's very curious about people. And that was quite a strength of hers that um, although she was very anxious and flighty, she was also very curious and interested to know you and want to be with you. So sitting up in, in joining in in family meals was a really good opportunity for learning for her as it is for all kids. So <clears throat> that was really important and really useful. Probably the most important thing for a case like Angela's and for all of the kids that you work with who have that kind of um, fear or aversion or um, uncomfortableness, is that a word? Discomfort, that's probably the proper English, 
um, around food and mealtimes is developing the trust. Um, and that's not something that happens overnight. Um, it's also something that sometimes even mums, even the mums have to work on. You know, they, they are so anxious and built up and concerned about the nutritional intake that sometimes they can damage that trust relationship around feeding and you have to rebuild that up. Um, and uh, Suzanne Evans-Morris, I know I keep going on but about her, but she advocates very much about feeding with permission. So um, trying to, and Marsha Dunklein as well, trying to build that intrinsic motivation in the child to participate in the mealtime, right? So building that trust and making it their choice that they're um, participating in the mealtime. Marsha Dunklein talks about trying to facilitate positive tilt. So you can see that illustrated in, the, in those two photos there that the bub on the left is happy and engaged and has positive tilt towards the caregiver who is offering the food, whereas the other bub, he's kind of taking it because he knows he has to, but he's leaning away and it, he's, not, um, he's not really giving permission for that to be happening to him at that time. And for Angela, that kind of approach was really important. It's slow, but it's important. So, where is she now? She's about to start school after these holidays. She's going to start to integrate into one of our local SSPs, special schools, um, two mornings a week. So that's a little bit terrifying for mum and a little bit terrifying for me. Um, but at home, she's settling in. She's never been to a daycare or a preschool, so this is really big for her family. Um, but at home, she's settling into meals really quickly now. So that's, that's really good. Um, she's quite happy. She's actually drinking from the cup most of the time. Um, not all of the time, but a lot of the time. And we've gone from the thickener um, to more naturally thick. So she did like fruit smoothies and that kind of thing already. So we've just dropped the thickener and she's having those kinds of drinks. So they are a little bit more slow moving so she's not getting assaulted um, by the drink, but she's um, tolerating that really well. So that's taken some of the pressure off the fluid intake, which is good. Um, she has started to pick up, she was picking up utensils um, for a little while and then we moved from there to potato sticks, um, dissolvable solids, and she will now pick those up and she has brushed them across her face and that kind of thing now. So we're starting to move towards a little bit of independence. Um, she's signing for more during mealtimes, which is awesome. Um, so we did some work around mum reading signals and all that kind of stuff. So as well as building up mum's ability to read her signals, we wanted to try and build up Angela's ability to send those signals in a way that mum could understand. So we've started to implement some signing and, you know, we know that more is a very motivating one, so that <coughs> kind of slotted quite well into the whole mealtime routine. We are waiting a little bit to see how the transition to school goes because we know she's not good with change. She may take a few steps back with the feeding when that happens. Um, but we're prepared and we know what works for her and what doesn't. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But that's pretty exciting. 